All right, guys, welcome back to Revive School. Here we are getting ready to finish up the Gospel of John, John 19 and then 20 and 21 for the next three days. And, you know, I'm excited because I, I remember praying through, Lord, how do, how do you want me to teach through John 19? I mean, there's a lot here. Just, just yesterday in John 18, you know, we, we referenced, um, you know, Jesus being handed over by Judas and, and then Peter denying uh, Christ, not just once, but then three times. And then in this process of the denial, Jesus says, has to come before Pilate. And then Pilate then, you know, gives a, 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 the audience, the Jews, a choice between Jesus and Barabbas. And so you really have a lot going on. I mean, this is the end of Christ's uh, physical time here on earth before he's crucified, before we get into any of the news of him coming back to life. And so I don't know how else to put it. It has to get worse before it can get a lot better. And that's really what John 19 is. It, it's, a, it's the bad news of the good news. I mean, when, when we look at these wristbands, you guys, we have the yellow, the black, the red, the blue, and the green. You know, the, the red is, is what we're experiencing, what we're going to be talking about, what he goes through, and which is the Romans 5, 8. Why God, but God demonstrates his own love that while we're still a mess, while we're still sinners, Christ died for us. Why did he do that? Because of the sin and the death. And so we got to go through, we got to talk through literally the beatings, the scourgings and him being crucified. And this is that day. I mean, this is the, the passion of the Christ lesson. I mean, this is the, the movie that you watch it and you're kind of like, I know I'm supposed to watch it, but I don't want to watch it. I know I, I should read John 19, but I don't really want to read it. And so all of these details are going to begin to unfold. I don't know how much we're going to get through because there's so much meat here. I mean, literally, in verse, verse 1, it says, Then Pilate, he took Jesus and had him flogged. I mean, this, this term flogged, okay? Think about this, okay? You have all of these thorns. It's made of these thorns in which they were attached in this, this big, long, like this long rope type. Like a whip. A whip, yeah, but they don't call Yes, the source doesn't call it a whip, but let's call it that, a whip. And then alongside of it is sharp pieces of metal and pieces of bone. So here you have this one, uh, you know, this, this, this scourging or this flogging that's going to take place. Not only does it take out the flesh, at times, if you do it enough, it could take out your organs. This is the image of a pilot taking Jesus and had him flogged. Now let's go to John 19, verse 2. The soldiers who had after just got done doing that, and they, they twisted together a crown of thorns. Remember, after he's already been beaten, they put it on his head. And you know when they put it on his head, you know they didn't loosely put it on there. You know they slammed it down, I'm sure, just to get it to stick. And then they threw a, a purple robe around him. So everything in verse 2 is just complete mockery. Everything. The purple robe, as Nelson's even says, is, you know, it's a mockery of a royal conqueror. And here he is, the king, beaten, bruised, uh, a crown of thorns on his head, and he's wearing a robe. And if it doesn't get any worse in verse three, they, came, they kept coming, it says repeatedly. So they kept coming up to Jesus and they said, hail king of the Jews. And not only were they verbally assaulting him, but they were physically slapping his face. I don't know what's worse out of all of these three verses already. The flogging, the crown, the purple robe, slapping him in the face, calling him the king of the Jews. Everything was a mockery. And, and what I wanna do is I wanna show in John 19 the Old Testament writers prophesied these things were going to happen at the death of the Messiah. And so, Kevin, if you would, would you go to Psalm 22, verse 7? And all I want to do is I just want to write down multiple prophecies, okay? One of them would just be Psalm 22, verse 7. And this is in regards to the mockery. Look at this. Everybody who sees me mocks me. They sneer and they shake their Heads. That's exactly what took place in John 19, uh, verse 3. All right, let's keep going to verse 4. It says, Pilate went out outside again, and he said to them, Look, I'm bringing him outside to you to let you know I find no grounds for charging him. In other words, Pilate is, he really, I think this is a fair statement, he really wanted to release Jesus. He didn't want anything to do with Jesus. He didn't like anything that was taking place. And in fact, he says... I find no grounds for charging him. You know that that's another prophecy. If you go to Isaiah 53, verse 9, look what, look what it says at the very end. They made his grave with the wicked. We'll get to that later. And with the rich man at his death, although he had done no violence and had not spoken deceitfully. It says, although he had done no violence. It's exactly, is this not exactly what Pilate is saying? He says, I don't find anything wrong with this man. And yet the, the prophet Isaiah said, that's what's going to happen. 
Uh, I like what Linsky wrote about this. It's one of the commentators. Uh, Jesus was not scourged in order to be crucified. Now, this is interesting, but in order to escape crucifixion. Let's say that one more time. I just want you to think through this. It's kind of an interesting. Jesus wasn't or it was not scourged in order to be crucified. In other words, they're not scourging him. They're not doing this to kill him, but they're doing this in order to escape crucifixion. It's an interesting thought process behind what Linsky is saying here. Just want to throw that out there as we begin, as we begin to unfold the rest of these Verses. Go to verse 5, if you would. Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to them, Here is the man. Look at him. And I love what Nelson says. He's beaten. He's pathetic. R really, you think this is the king of the Jews? I mean, look at him. Here he is. And in verse 6, it says, When the chief priests and the temple police, remember, they have a police even on the temple. When the temple police saw him, they shouted, Crucify, crucify. And Pilate says again, he responded, take him and crucify him yourselves, for I find no grounds for charging him. In other words, you take care of this guy because I don't, I don't want anything, anything to do with him. Strangely enough, this is Pilate's third time, third time that he says, I don't find any fault in this guy named Jesus. Kevin, if you would, would you go to John 18, verse 38? Three times Pilate says, I didn't. I didn't, I don't see anything wrong with this guy. In John 18, verse 38, what is the truth, asked, said Pilate. And after he said this, he went out to the Jews again and he told them, I find no grounds for charging him. First time, Pilate says, now there's nothing wrong with this guy. Second time, we just read this, but I want to reiterate this, John 19, verse 4. Second time, what does Pilate say? We've already covered this. He just says, I'm bringing him outside to you, let you know I find no grounds for charging him. That's the second and then the third time we just read it in John 19, 6, I find no grounds for charging him. Three times the man in charge says, I don't find anything wrong with him. And yet what happens? He continues to put him through the process. If we can, Kevin, I want to go to a couple more prophecies here. You know, Isaiah 53, 3. There's two prophecies that unfold. And in Isaiah 53, 3, one of the prophecies it talks about is that he's going to be hated. It says he was despised and rejected by men. Okay, now think about this. What were the people shouting? Crucify, crucify. I think that would be fair to say they, they hate him. <laughs> hey, let's kill him, let's kill him. That's exactly what they're saying. And at the same time, we've already covered this, but he's innocent if you go to Isaiah 53, 9. It says this, although he had done no violence and had not spoken deceitfully. Again, here we have in verse 6, the same thing that's reiterating in verse 4. So here you have already, you guys, in three verses in John 19, literally alluding to at least three to four verses in the Old Testament. Jesus is, his life is literally becoming, I mean, what does it say in Matthew? It says in Matthew 5, he says, I didn't come to destroy or abolish, but to fulfill. When you think of fulfillment of scripture, nobody wants to talk about this side of fulfillment, right? You think about that. Oh yeah, the Messiah's coming. He's going to come back on the Mount of Olives. Oh yeah, the Messiah is going to come in on a donkey. Oh yeah, the Messiah is going to be born, uh, you know, in Bethlehem. Like all of these prophecies, we're okay with. We like these. These are the ones that make you almost like, I can't, I can't believe Jesus had to fulfill these. But he had to fulfill these in order for us to experience life. If we can, Kevin, let's just keep going here. In John 19, verse 7. It says, we have a law, the Jews replied to him. Remember, Pilate's, Pilate's like, nah, there's nothing wrong. But the Jews came back to him with, oh, they, there is a problem. And according to that law, the Jews said, he must die because he made himself the son of God. Rich, what are they, what are they saying here? What's the problem here? They're saying he's one with God, that he's God. And so they would call this blasphemy. And so they have this issue with, when you say you're God, that's blasphemy. In fact, Leviticus 24 Verse 16, this is what they probably would have been hanging on to. Whoever blasphemies, the name of the Lord is to be put to death. So what Jesus is saying by he's saying he's the son of God, he needs to be put to death. In fact, the whole community must stone him. If he blasphemies the name, he is to be put to death, whoever the foreign resident or the native. So the Jews say, oh, no, no, Pilate, he is guilty. He's saying he's God. Therefore, we must stone him. We must kill him. And in fact, this is a theme that the Jews had a problem with all throughout the Gospel of John. In fact, John 5, verse 18, this is the constant theme that they didn't like that they saw in Jesus. 
In John 5, verse 18, this is why the Jews began trying all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. So this was not the only instance. They're saying, oh, no, no, there's, there's been more instances. In fact, John 8, verse 58, same thing. They're holding on to how dare this man, Jesus, say he is God. In fact, John 8, verse 58, Jesus said, I assure you, before Abraham was, I am. And verse 59 kind of puts it together. At that, they picked up and stones to throw at him because Jesus, but Jesus was hidden and went out of the temple complex. By Jesus saying he was before Abraham, he's implying, hey, by the way, I, I am God. And so when Pilate says there's nothing wrong with him, the Jews would completely disagree. And they would say, no, by him saying he is the Son of God, he is breaking our law. And in John 10, verse 33, they just kept holding on to these scenarios. Uh, we aren't stoning you for a good work, the Jews answered, but for blasphemy. Because you, being a man, make yourself God. And then in verse 36, Scripture says this, Do you say you're blaspheming to the one the Father set apart and sent into the world because I said I am the Son of God? So Jesus understands the Jews don't like what he's saying. And so I want to I just paint this picture. Pilate doesn't really care if Jesus says he's the Son of God. Would you guys agree? This isn't Pilate's law. This is the Jews' law. And so he's saying, I don't want anything to do with this. But the Jews say, oh, this has everything to do with what's wrong. And in fact, in verse 8, this is why Pilate even got more nervous. When, they hear, when he heard that the Jews were saying, oh, he says who he says he is, Pilate heard the statement, he was more afraid than ever. Verse 9, the scripture just says this, he went back into the headquarters, and this is Pilate, and he asked Jesus, where are you from? <laughs> I love this question. Like, they just said you keep saying you're the son of God. In fact, multiple times throughout the Gospel of John, you have said you're the son of God. Who are you? Where are you from? And I love Jesus' answer. He didn't give him one. But Jesus did not give him an answer. You know, you would think if you want to save your life, this would probably be a good time. But Jesus knows he has to go through the suffering. There's no reason, no point in saying, oh yeah, that's right, I am him. I mean, right? He, he knows he's got to go through this process. So he doesn't actually give him an answer. And what you'll find out throughout Christ's life, this is pretty common. Rarely does he defend himself before other people. In fact, just as a couple examples, Kevin, Matthew 26, verse 63, if you would. Go back to verse 62, if you would, just to give you a... Uh, here you have the high priest. He's, he's asking Jesus, don't you have an answer to what these men are testifying against you? And, and in verse 63, it says, but Jesus kept silent. Now, out of the four of us here in this room, uh, I probably would probably have the hardest time keeping silent. Would you guys agree? Uh, maybe Kevin. Kevin, would you have a hard time keeping silent? I think all of us would have a hard time. But Jesus, he kept silent over and over. Go to Matthew 27, verse 14. But he didn't answer him on even one charge so that the governor was greatly amazed. So Jesus before the governor, nothing. Nothing. Sometimes I get tired of the church like trying to always defend themselves. And like it feels like we have to sell ourselves sometimes to get our point across, our position across, and Jesus didn't at all. I just think it's a great example, one that we can learn from, and I'd say myself included. In John 19, verse 10, so Pilate said to them, remember, Jesus hadn't said anything. You're, you're not talking to me? <laughs> Hello? <laughs> Don't you know that I have the authority to release you and the authority to crucify you? In other words, if you say something remote that maybe I can grab a hold of, I could actually release you. Like, I have the authority to release you, and yet you're not saying anything? And crazy enough, Kevin, if you'd go to Isaiah 53, verse 7, you see another prophecy unfold. And the prophecy is, he's quiet. Isaiah 53, 7 says, he was oppressed and afflicted. So far, I think that's probably what we've seen. Yet, he did not open his mouth. You know, one of the themes you'll see here, we have Psalm 22 we're referencing. We see Isaiah 53. Do you know that many, many Jews today do not even recognize Isaiah 53, the chapter, even exists in the book of Isaiah? You go from Isaiah 52 to Isaiah 54, but no Isaiah 53. Anyone want to guess why? Because they point to the Messiah and his name is Yeshua. He was quiet. He didn't even open his mouth. 
Scripture continues on in verse 11, you would have no authority over me at all. So Jesus, the next thing you know, he says something. If it hadn't been given you from above, this is why the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. Can you go to Isaiah 53, verse 10 for me, Kevin? I love this. Um, who's the authority? Uh, there's a couple questions that we can answer with this, but one of them, and then the main one is, is yet the Lord was pleased to crush him severely. What does that imply? Who has the authority? The Lord. The Lord was pleased to crush his own child and crush him severely. So in John 19, 11, when we talk about this, the prophecy in reference to Isaiah 53, 10, the authority is, is the Lord. It's God. You don't have any authority. In fact, if it hadn't been given you from above, this is why the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. Now, now that's where you can transition. If it hadn't been given to you from above, we know that that's God. But then this is why the one who handed me over to you, what? Has the greater sin. Okay, so in reference to Caiaphas saying, hey, I'm, I'm handing him over to you now. And so there's a lot here, but I love how the prophecy, it keeps on pointing to. It's like Isaiah 53 and John 19 are like just, hand in a glove. So we know the authority came from above God, but then who handed him over could be Caiaphas, could be Judas. No, nobody really, really knows, but I do want to just say those are your options. And then it says in verse 12, from that moment, Pilate made every effort to release him. This goes back to Sean's favorite character in John 19, Pilate. But the Jews shouted, if you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Anyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. So now all of a sudden, as Constable says, the Jews are becoming more of a threat than actually Jesus. So the question is that Pilate has to begin to understand, who do I have to deal with, Jesus or the Jews? And in verse 13, it becomes clear who Pilate decides to side with. It says, when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside. He sat down on the judge's bench in a place called the Stone Pavement. Here you have this big, large area. And then in verse 14, in this process, it's a large open space is what you need to know. It was the preparation day for the Passover. And it was about six in the morning, the sixth hour. And then he told the Jews, here is your king. Now, the preparation day would have been the Friday of the Passover week. Because Jesus is going to, as we know in Matthew 27, is going to be sacrificed on Friday. So Pilate says, hey, by the way, here is your king. But they shouted in verse 15, take him away, take him away, crucify him. And Pilate then said, should I crucify your king? We have no king but Caesar. So all of a sudden the Jews switch complete allegiance. Isn't this crazy? No, 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 it's not this guy, but now all of a sudden Caesar. That goes against everything. Now everything just seems to be out of control. The Jews are now saying, oh no, the, now, now Caesar is our king. And we know that's not the case at all, but they, they said that in order, to, in order to see Jesus crucified. I think that's what happens. People begin to compromise who they are in their beliefs in order to get their fleshly things taken care of. So it says in verse 16, So then, because of them, the Jews, he handed him, Jesus, over to be crucified. Therefore they took Jesus away. And in verse 17, you read a controversial little verse, a little phrase, carrying his own cross. Any, any idea why that creates a problem? He was pretty much beaten to death, so it had been hard to carry a cross. It was, but in this verse, it says he did, but we know who did. Oh, uh, Simon. Simon, it would have been very hard to carry his cross. So Kevin, you're, you're right, it, been, it was so hard that eventually we know that Simon in Matthew 27 carried his cross. And then Jesus, he went out to a place called Skull Place. Kevin, we have a picture over here. Uh, it's also known in Hebrew as Golgotha, okay? Now down here you have actually, it's an Arab bus station. So today you have an Arab bus station in, in perhaps an area uh, in front of Golgotha. Do we, are we 100% convinced that this is it? No, but then when you zoom in, you can kind of see the face of a skull, skull place, okay? All right here, right? The eyes, the nose, you guys, you guys see that right there? So carrying his cross, maybe Jesus brought his cross and his body to this, to this place in front of the Arab bus station. Classic, right? Then it says this in verse 18, 
Uh, we do know this. I think this is important, okay? Uh, that in John 19, verse 17, I, I don't want to miss this one because there's another prophecy here. It says that the prophecy said he's going to carry his own cross. Kevin, can you go to Matthew 16, verse 24? I know I'm, I'm crossing over here into the New Testament. But in Matthew uh, 16, 24, then Jesus said, If anybody wants to come with me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And so here you have just this imagery of take up his cross. Uh, all right, so here you have it. So Jesus, he says, you have, these are the things you have to do. So it's important that he does it as well. Scripture then says in verse 18, there they crucified Jesus at this place right here and two others with him, one on either side, one with Jesus in the middle. Now, you know, I know you guys have all seen this. You've all seen this imagery. But I mean, this is where we get it from. There was three crosses, uh, two others, one on each side. And we know that they were thieves. We know that they were robbers based on Matthew and Mark. But John doesn't seem to get into any of those details. And then in verse 19, it says, Pilate also had a sign lettered and he put on the cross. The inscription was Jesus the Nazarene, Nazarene, the king of the Jews. So above the cross, you would have seen a sign. And this is what the sign was said. Now in verse 20, scripture continues. And many of the Jews who read this sign because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. Remember, the discussion is rich, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but the discussion was that this had to be outside the city. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. The crucifixion needed to be outside the city, but near the city, okay? That was part of the prophetic picture. And then it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. Now, if you go to Jerusalem today, you're gonna to see this picture here. You're gonna see always languages. You're gonna see Arabic, you're gonna see uh, Hebrew, you're gonna see English. Why? Because so many people, I believe it's the city of the world, to be honest. I think everybody and their brother, like it, it just seems like they flock to the holy city. And so in this context of the sign above the cross, it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. That was the local, the common, and the official languages. And so the chief priests of the Jews, they said to Pilate, and they were mad that Pilate did this, don't write the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. In other words, how dare you say that's what, that's what it is. It's one thing for somebody to say he is, but it's another thing to actually proclaim this is the king of the Jews. So when you come by the cross and you see the king of the Jews, then people might actually think he is. So it says in verse 22, Pilate replied, what I have written, I have written. Sean, again, your, your buddy Pilate comes through again, right? He, he knows what he's doing. Whether he did it the right way or not, at least he's sticking to his guns and and he said he is the king of the Jews. And in verse 23, he says, when the soldiers crucified Jesus. So it's already happened. It's interesting how it just happens just like that, right? They put him on the cross and all of a sudden it says the soldiers crucified Jesus. They took his clothes. They divided him into four parts, a part for each soldier. They also took the tunic, which was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. Man, in verse 24, so they said to one another, let's not tear it, but let's cast lots for it to see who gets it. They did this to fulfill the scripture that says they divided my clothes among themselves and they cast lots for my clothing. And this is what the soldiers did. So here you have in John 19 verses 23 and 24. What do you know? You have another. Kevin, can you go to Psalm 22 verse 18? Just exactly what we read, but they cast lots and they divided the clothes. I think it's absolutely mind blowing when you take Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53 and you begin to see John 19 100 percent come to fruition. I mean, it's crazy to me how the Old Testament points to the Messiah's suffering. In verse 25 through 27, you begin to see Jesus' provision really for his, his mother. And he says, standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. And this is interesting, guys. In verse 26, look what he says. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple he loved, which we know is the author John, the apostle John, John and James, right? Uh, the sons of Zebedee. Here we have John, and he says to his mother, Mary, woman, here is your son. It's crazy to me in verse 27 then. Then he said to the disciple, John, here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. It was like, John, I need you to take care of my, my mother. The one that I trust, would you take care of my mother? And I, I just think if you, in amidst the crucifixion, amidst the suffering, Jesus takes care of his mom and says, hey, would you take care of, of my mom? I just think it's an unbelievable showing of love even amidst the cross. 
And I'll be honest, I don't think I've ever slowed down to read that and process exactly what Jesus was doing there. It's crazy. And in this process, in verse 28, and I know we're running out of time here, um, in verse 28, really through 30, you begin to see what we would classify as the finished work of Christ. And as a finished work of Christ, really what it means in verse 30, it says, he even says, it is finished. He bowed and then he gave up his, his spirit. And then what you see in verses 31 through 37, Jesus' side is pierced. There's a lot there, you guys. Oh, man, there's so much here. Now, I want to just jump down really quick to verse 36, if I can. Verse 36 and 37, just so I don't miss some of the prophecies here. It says, for these things happen. Remember, Jesus' bones weren't broken. Why? Because he was already dead. Do you remember this? The disciples, or the guys next to him, they had to break their bones. But when it came to Jesus, he was already dead. And so it said, this was fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. It's a fulfillment of the Passover lamb. Do you remember this, you guys? You don't break the bones of the Passover lamb. So in Exodus 12, verse 46, that's exactly what you see. Jesus becomes a fulfillment of Exodus 12, verse 46. You may not take any of the meat outside of the house and you may not break any of its bones. Talking about the Passover lamb. Uh, the last one in verse 37, if we could, it says another scripture says they will look at the one they pierce. This is in full reference to Zechariah 12, 10. They will look at the one that they pierce and oh, man, this is crazy. No bones here broken. And look at the one they're pierced. Because in Zechariah uh, 12, 10, Kevin, if you would, Zechariah 12, 10, it says, eventually they will look at the one that they pierced, right? And it says this, in the residents of Jerusalem, they will look at me whom they pierced. They will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly for him as one weeps for a firstborn. There's so much fulfillment in the Old Testament to the New Testament. And this is exactly what we see in John 19. And John 19 is beginning to see a fulfillment of Psalm 22, Isaiah 53. And because of time, just so you know, in John 19, verses 38 through 42, you see Jesus' burial. And we know that the rich man, right? The rich man, Joseph of Marathia, provides the tomb. Again, another fulfillment of Scripture. John 19, there's a lot there. Uh, I'm pretty sure we got to pretty much maybe half of it today. <laughs> Uh, I just tell you this because all of this to me in Matthew 10, John 15, and Matthew 16 says, we will be hated because of his account. I want you to understand that the world's going to hate us because of who we are in Christ. So much to the point where we have to, because of everything that he's gone, gone through, we need to learn what it says in Matthew 16. We need to deny ourselves, take up the cross, and learn to follow Christ. The only way we can understand Matthew 16 is to begin to embrace Psalm 22, Isaiah 53, and what's the bigger picture of John 19. Thanks for your patience, guys, as we unfold this, unpack this. Please, please, please dig into your study guide. Look at Laura's devotional daily word as this will continue to take us deeper in understanding why Christ suffered for each one of us. Thanks. Thanks.